Start basketball. Hey, hoop heads! Wanted to take a minute to shout out our partners and friends at Doctor Dish Basketball. We've had their partnership manager and training specialist Jefferson Mason, and marketing manager Nick Bartlett on the show in the past, and we couldn't be more excited about what they're doing for the game of basketball. Their Doctor Dish shooting machines are undoubtedly the most advanced and user-friendly machines on the market. Sure, accountability. These are just a few reasons why top programs like Duke, North Carolina, Louisville, Florida, Baylor, and countless others are upgrading to Dr. Dish. Learn more at drdishbasketball.com. Follow their incredible content at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And make sure you mention the Hoop Heads podcast to get $300 off your next Dr. Dish purchase. That's a great deal, Hoop Heads. Get out and get your Dr. Dish shooting machine today. I learned as a high school coach, you better have some non-negotiables that you have for your team. And what I mean by that are, what are some things that you absolutely will emphasize on a daily basis? And if they don't do that, you are going to let them know every time. Coach Don Showalter is a 10-time USA Basketball gold medalist while serving as head coach of the USA men's U16 and U17 national teams from 2009 through 2018. In May of 2016, he was hired as a coach director for USA Basketball's youth division, a high school coach in the state of Iowa for 42 years, and a nine-time USA Basketball Developmental Coach of the Year award winner. Coach Showalter owns a perfect 62-0 record at the helm of USA Basketball's U16 and U17 teams, Coach Showalter compiled a 601 and 346 overall record during his 42 seasons as a high school head coach, including 16 district titles and six state tournament appearances. Don is the director of the Snow Valley Basketball School, one of the premier camps in the country for individual player skill development. You will not find a coach with a wider range of basketball experiences than Coach Showalter. He is a true servant leader who cares about the players he coaches, both on and off the court. If you have a chance to leave us a five-star rating and review on your favorite podcast app, we would really appreciate it. Tell your friends in the coaching community about the show and make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. Check out hoopheadspod.com where you can listen to every episode we've ever recorded and find out more about what drives our show. Coach Showalter shares a few pages of his famous mind candy that you want to jot down as you listen to this episode. Please enjoy our conversation with Coach Don Showalter from USA Basketball. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here with my co-host Jason Sunkel. And tonight we are pleased to welcome back to the podcast Coach Don Showalter from USA Basketball. Show, welcome back. Hey, glad to be back. I know you guys have been kind of sequestered here, as everybody has, (laughs) but uh, your, your podcast has been great. I, I don't think I've missed one of them uh, f- for, for many, many times. So uh, you guys do a great job, and, and uh, I applaud you for, for growing, the game of, growing the game of basketball, uh, in, in your, certainly with your podcast. Well, we appreciate you. There's been no bigger supporter of our podcast uh, in terms of contributing to our roundtables and just – generally supporting the things that we're trying to do here with the pod. So we appreciate everything that you've done to help us. And we're thankful that you've been willing to jump back on with us. We wanted to have you on to, first of all, talk about the impact of the current situation with COVID-19 on USA basketball and just some of the plans. Jason and I were talking a little bit last night when we think about the, the men's national team and the Olympics being postponed and then thinking about the NBA season, which may or may not resume this year, and then it looks likely that next season will be pushed back. Uh, Maybe NBA players will still be in season next year when the Tokyo Olympics takes place. So just kind of give us the state of what's happening from your perspective in terms of USA basketball, both at the junior level and then maybe also at the senior level as well. Yeah, you know, that's a lot of unknowns, obviously. Yeah, um, Basically, we – up up to this point, and you know, you you take a look. It seems like we've been, I've been working uh, 
our office has been closed since uh, since March 12th, and uh, actually March 13th, I think. But you know, it seems like it's been two months instead of <laughs> instead of a couple it weeks. Sure does. Uh, but you know, we we were in Colorado um, uh, on March 12th, and we flew back. So that's only been like 13 days. But when we flew back uh, to Iowa on March 12th from Colorado Springs, uh, I got off the plane and uh, got a got a text from from my coworker who I work closely with. The N- said the NBA season has been can- the NCAA March Madness has been canceled. The NC uh, the NBA season. Had had been canceled. I mean, all within like two hours from <laughs> while I was on the plane. Right, exactly. So things have changed. Welcome home, welcome yeah, home, no, qu- no kidding. <laughs> things have changed really quick on on the forefront. Of course, um, you know when those when multi billion dollar uh, sports organizations cancel their events, you, you obviously know it's going to trickle down to too many many other events as well, and that's kind of what has happened. But uh, as far as USAB, you know, obviously we're a part of the FIBA uh, uh, organization, which governs uh, international basketball. Uh, and then our youth division, we do our uh, academies and uh, uh, those are events there too, which, you know, academies, our open courts, our USA basketball, uh, USA uh, tournament, that we do in July. So a lot of those things are under our youth three on three, huge, some big three on three stuff was coming up, but um, I, all those are on hold right now. Obviously uh, April 10th uh, was kind of the, is kind of when we have, when we were given the date of our office being uh, closed up until then. Um, and I, you know, who knows what's going to happen after April 10th, but I, I think it's going to continue for, several weeks beyond that. So all our events were canceled up through April 10th. Uh, those events included, um, you know, we had a, we had a mini camp during the final four, which we always do with our, with our players, top 80, top 80, uh, 60 to 80 players in, in the country, uh, from, from all levels, uh, all the way up from U16 through U18s. Uh, we bring them into the final four um, venue and have a have a mini camp, and then they also scrimmage um, the NBA academies. The NBA academies are in India and Africa and, and uh, Latin America, uh, Australia, um, Europe. So, so those NBA academies obviously were you know didn't come. We didn't do that. But that was a big, that's a big event for us just to uh, play uh, those academies uh, with international rules and, and kind of get ready for our training camps. And the fun part of that that the kids missed out on is that our kids then also get a practice on the final four floor on Sunday morning. So last year in Minneapolis, you know, you can imagine how excited our kids were to, to practice and scrimmage on the final four floor. Uh, that was going to be used late, uh, on Monday for the championship, national championship game. So um, that's kind of heartbreaking for a lot of kids, obviously. But uh, we knew, we knew uh, that was not going to happen. So that that event got canceled. Uh, then, of course, everything around the Final Four uh, was canceled too. We had we had uh, some uh, we had uh, NABC. We always do some a session with the NABC. National Association of Basketball Coaches. Uh, we have a social, USA Basketball Social, which is always very well attended uh, during the Final Four. So those all got canceled. And then and then after that, we have our scheduled uh, Hoop Summit was in Portland, uh, April April 10th, which is our 12 of our top seniors uh, against an international group of U19 players. So that's that's a huge event for us. Draws about seven to ten thousand every year at the Moda Center in, in Portland. So, so those are officially events that have been affected by the coronavirus and been canceled. Uh, they, they've been canceled. Obviously, they're not going to 
but we didn't postpone those. They're, they're, they're in the cancellation mode. So we're not going to have the Hoop Summit this year. We're not going to have the other mini camp. So, um, so we're kind of a stalemate right now coming into end of April and May. We have, uh, you know, our uh, U18 training camp uh, was, uh, was, is going to start. Uh, around the 25th, 26th of May, uh, and then um, they were to leave for that group is going to play in uh, Argentina, Rosario, uh, first part of June. Our U17 World Championship players, uh, we're going to start uh, training camp with them on June 17th, 15th, 16th, 17th, somewhere in there, and then um, go to uh, Bulgaria for their tournament. Now, officially they have not been canceled. Um, and I think uh, FIBA is going to take a look at those, uh, both boys and girls tournaments this week and decide what to do, what to do with those. So those are always, it's kind of tough because you, you go by age groups for those. And so if you wait another year, you, you really miss that age group. Uh, and you just, you'd have to start over with U16s a year from the summer. But as of right now, we haven't got, got have, haven't got the official word that they're, that they're canceled. But our, our national, uh, our national three on three tournament in Colorado Springs, uh, U18 national tournament there has been, uh, it's supposed to be, uh, at the end of, end of April. Um, and that's been, that's been postponed. Uh, except for a later date, our uh, our uh, three on three open uh, tournament, uh, which was which was supposed to be an Olympic qualifier uh, in India, has been canceled or postponed. So just a lot of things like that are affecting what we're doing. And then we've had we have academy scheduled, uh, coaches academy scheduled for LA in May May sixteenth seventeenth I think. In LA, uh, we haven't made a final decision on that yet. Probably won't hear for another couple of weeks. Um, and then also we have some gold camps coming up, and our gold camps are for uh, higher skilled uh, middle school players, seventh and eighth grade players, and uh, they're going to be in Dallas at the end of May. So, you know, we have a lot of events. This we're just starting our event season, and boy, this was uh, you know it's obviously a big time for us and uh, what's going on. And I'm, I'm sure everybody has heard that the Olympics have been uh, postponed for a year. Um, so that takes away some of the qualifying tournaments that our senior men's team have been doing. Uh, uh, so we're backing up to the men's junior national team with the U17 and U18. That's basically on hold till we find out what's what FIBA has decided to do with that, uh, those situations. And then, uh, you know, the options are cancel or move it, move it to the fall. But then you, you know, there's all kinds of problems that arise because of the movement and, and, and that. Our senior men's team, you know, obviously the Olympics were this, this coming year and that was a big thing for us. And, uh, but it, it's, it's right. It was the right thing to do. Uh, we, we certainly support, uh, you know, the USOC uh, and what they in the IOC International Olympic Committee for for going ahead and, and uh, pushing the Olympics back until 2021. And we just had a conference call today, and we really don't know what that's going to look like, when it's going to be. They just said it has to be within the first nine months of 2021. So somewhere between January and, and end of September will be the Olympics. And, uh, uh, you know, we we don't know when it, that that'll probably be in the next week or so what the details are on that but it could be you know we're thinking maybe it might be april may uh you we, they could have uh it could could be in in different uh have different sports have their olympics at different times so we just don't you know you just don't we just don't know what's going to happen there yet but but we're i mean we we feel real confident that uh, the NBA is going to, we're going to work well with the NBA and, and get to get, get players that can help us, whether they start their season late or end their season 
early, whatever, suspend the season a little bit. It, it's in, and in that situation, there's a lot of obviously foreign players that international players are playing the NBA. So it affects them as well. So that's kind of it. Uh, in June, we had Academy scheduled in uh, the coaches Academy scheduled for, uh, for Dallas, uh, second week of June 12th and 13th. You know, we just, we just hope we can get some of that in, but if we don't, we'll, we'll postpone and we're flexible. And, uh, I think everybody has to be a little bit flexible this time, this time of year when you have, uh, what we're dealing with, with the coronavirus. Yeah, no question. Flexibility is going to be key for everybody. I think if you look at the Olympics being pushed back and obviously they waited, I think probably as long as any major sporting event all around the world, they held on to try to see if they, there was a way that they could make it happen. And then eventually it became clear that it just wasn't going to work. And then, like I said earlier, Jason and I were talking last night about the NBA. And I know there's been a great relationship between USA basketball and the NBA. So I'm sure that those two organizations are going to do everything they can to ensure that the best guys that, and the guys that want to be there representing our country get an opportunity to play in the Olympics. It'll be interesting to, I hadn't thought of or heard that you might have different sports going at different times of the year, which I, I would think from a basketball perspective, if that were the case where there could be some flexibility, because as you said, it's not just, you know, we're looking at it from a USA basketball perspective, but clearly there are lots of more international players in the NBA than there ever have been. And so all those teams and those players are going to be affected as well. So it would seem to be in the best interest of everybody, both the Olympics in terms of generating interest in the basketball tournament and in the various pro leagues, including the NBA, to figure out a way to make it work. It's just obviously with this season being shortened from an NBA standpoint, it seems like whatever's going to happen next year, they're going to want to make sure they get their 82 games in and the full schedule. So I think there's probably going to be some challenges figuring out when that time is going to really work out so that they can get people, uh, get players to play in the Olympics and see what happens. So it'll be interesting. It's, it's definitely going to be, there'll definitely be some, a lot of discussions around that issue going forward. I'm sure. Um, Adam Silver. I just have a lot of respect for Adam Silver at the NBA. He's, he's, He's a very intelligent individual, and um, he just he seems to push the right buttons at the right time. I think you know he, right when Rudy Gobert uh, was had the uh, uh, had the coronavirus. Uh, I mean, right away he didn't waste any time and suspend the season. Um, you know he he's one to act quick, but uh, he certainly he's he's really a, one of those one of those. Uh, people who I have a lot of respect for. And he's, he's always worked well. They've always worked really, really well closely with, 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 uh, with us because their NBA is a big partner of the USA basketball. So, um, so whatever decision is made on that, I'm sure is going to be for the best for players and uh, everybody else. Uh, um, so, and, and uh, you know, our, our coaching staff uh, is stayed intact. Um, Popovich from the Spurs has indicated he's he's on board for sure for 21. Um, it was kind of a at, at the end of 20 at the end of two at the end of this summer after the Olympics. Um, it was you know he that was kind of his uh, extended piece of of, uh, of, the, of the contract for working with USA Basketball, but uh, he graciously decided he, you know he's going to see it out through through whenever the Olympics are. So hopefully he can still be that coach uh, for our Olympic team as well. Yeah, that'd be great. Is any speculation on what might happen after that? Not if you have any classified information, but any thoughts about where uh, or who might be in line to be considered for that position once Popovich is done? Yeah, you know, we really haven't even crossed that hurdle at all yet. Uh, uh, I, I, you know, I think there's, you know, I think there's a lot of really good possibilities, both in the NBA and the collegiate world, uh, that would be uh, possible uh, coaches for for our senior men's team. And and it, you know, I mean, Popovich may be in that in that mix going forward as well f for another year. So, uh, like I said, we really don't know. We haven't really crossed that uh, hurdle yet at all, and, and so it'll be. Uh, 
that'll be something that's that'll be down the road after the Olympics. For sure. Can you talk a little bit about you mentioned while you were speaking earlier about some of the events that were canceled? You talked about some of the three on three events, and clearly with three on three joining the Olympics in what would have been this summer, but now next summer, I think it's going to lead to an explosion in the popularity of three on three as people get a chance to see the game. And I think as you look around the youth landscape, um, the more and more coaches that we talk to, the more you hear about the need for playing three on three and playing those small sided games, whether it's in a league format or whether it's within the confines of a team practice. So talk a little bit about USA basketball's stance on three on three and just kind of where where you see three on three heading in the future and, and how USA basketball is going to continue to promote and support three on three going forward here. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, we're really excited about the, the three on three, uh, Red Bull has done a great job of being one of our sponsors and they're pouring a large sum of money into, and, and not only that, but they're doing a great job of marketing our three on three, um, the three on three. If you, if you, you know, your listeners, if you if you watch that uh, on on the international three on three on TV, it's really an exciting, fast paced uh, game. It's got a twelve second shot clock. Um, you know, teams take the ball out underneath on a made basket. They have to take it out underneath the basket in the charge circle, and they can either throw it out to a player or they may dribble it out from there. Uh, they cannot be guarded. Uh, you, you can't be defended if you're standing in a circle to make a pass. But as soon as you dribble out, then you can be defended. So, um, you know, the three-on-three the three, uh, and the three-on-three three players are, you know, you, you have to really make, I think we have, we've made some great decisions on who to have play three-on-three because three, it's a, the game is different, so different from, five on five that you need a little different kind of player. Um, you know, your, your bigger, slower type of player is not very effective in a three on three. Um, you know, Robbie Hummel, uh, who played at Purdue that, that we've, we're all kind of familiar with. He's, he's probably one of our best, well, he is one of our best top three on three players. Uh, he's long, he can shoot the ball, he can get the basket, but players like him are, are very very good and he's part of our open three on three and and uh you know <clears throat> moving forward we'll we have we haven't officially qualified uh, our teams yet for three on three FIBA set up a there's a whole point system that is developed by FIBA because they don't want us or any other country just to pick you know LeBron James Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant you we can't we can't do that for a three on three. It's it's players. You have to be uh, accumulate points by playing in tournaments, three on three tournaments throughout the whole year. So we send those guys all over the world. We send teams all over the world to play in three on three tournaments so they can accumulate points that will benefit us uh, to qualify for uh, the, the Olympics and and qualify players for the Olympics. So. That's, that's a little bit different from that standpoint. People ask, I get the question, well, why, why can't you just ask, you know, LeBron James and two other guys to play three on three? Well, that's not the point of, of why it was developed. The three on three was developed. So countries really have a chance that don't, can't play five on five or don't have the five on five capacity to, to, to make a good team. They, they can play th- they can have get three or four guys to play. So countries you really are you're not even don't even hear about much with bat, with five on five basketball have really good uh, some really good three on three teams. Uh, Africa, um, Nairobi, uh, uh, you know India, some of those teams that just could not function very well five on five certainly do a very good job of three on three. So. That's kind of the basis for what we're looking at, and and we'll have qualifying tournaments. We think we have enough points. If you if you have enough world three on three points, um, again, I don't don't want to bore anybody with a lot of the details, but uh, and you're in the top three, that automatically qualifies you for the 
uh, for the Olympics. Um, and then, and then uh, the other five spots are through qualification tournaments. So uh, India was one of those places where we were supposed to be at. Even if you qualify, you still need to go to the qualifying tournament. So um, I think in, uh, our men um, had a great chance to qualify uh, from the point total because we had we had quite a few we had a lot a large number of points and I think our women were if they didn't qualify then then they had a good chance to do it through the through the qualification tournament so that's the open part of it uh, 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 Jason and Mike but then there there's also U18 tournament and U18 we host the U18 national which is which will be high school, basically high school juniors, uh, that are that are really good. Uh, so we'll bring them in for a for a national tournament we, uh, scheduled for the end of April and May. Uh, again, we're not sure that's going to happen, but uh, and then we'll have there'll be about 12, 12 or fifteen teams involved in that, and then we'll pick four players to represent the United States in the world U eighteen three on three. Uh, World Cup. Um, I think that's in. Uh, I'm not. I. I won't. I don't. I won't say for sure because I'm not. Not for sure where it's at. But um, uh, there, it's 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 all internationally based. So I think last year was in. Uh, uh, Might have been in Asia somewhere. I, I was at one in Spain one year. I took a group to Spain one year. I took a group to Indonesia one year for those tournaments. So, uh, so that's it's a really a big thing uh, for USA basketball. Uh, to qualify uh, for that, and um, we were going to host a big, big tournament in Vegas coming up. Of course, that's been postponed, but um, a lot of interest uh, now, and obviously, it's going to be a lot more interest in uh, the since it starts the Olympics. And, and I equivalent it to the fact that you know you uh, beach volleyball, where you play two on each side. It's not a full volleyball contingent. Uh, that's kind of what it is for three-on-three -three basketball, um, and and uh, you know obviously I, I'm a big proponent of three-on-three, -three, playing three-on-three -three in in your regular practice session. So this is just an extension of that, and it should be should be really fun to watch. Crowds get into it; and it's fast-paced, and uh, it it is uh, it's it's a, a different type of of game. The ball is. Both men and women use the same. Um, they use the same ball. Uh, the ball is a little bit uh, smaller than the men's ball, um, but the weight is the same as the women's ball. So, uh, little different balls being used by both men and women. But uh, it's really fun. And, yeah, uh, it is the international, the FIBA version of three on three. If people haven't seen that and you don't know what it looks like. It's hard to it's hard to visualize it until you see it because when you think of fast when you think of three on three half court basketball a lot of us think of what three on three basketball may have been the old rec league three on three and checking it up every time up top and people walking around to get matched up and all that stuff. and this game is not at all like that it's super fast paced and I think that's what really makes the game fun and enjoyable both I'm sure to play and to watch from a spectator side of it just. I want to ask you one more thing regarding three on three. Do you ever see a time, and this would just be pure speculation, but I'm just curious to get your opinion. Do you ever see a time where three on three basketball could make its way into high schools as a scholastic, as an interscholastic sport? So where two schools would be competing and you'd actually have, you might have your five on five traditional basketball team. And then you might also potentially have, three on three or even maybe some rural areas where it's difficult to feel the full team. Maybe teams just go completely to three on three. Do you ever see a time where that could potentially be possible? Well, I mean, at this time, uh, you know, probably not for in the immediate future, but you know, who, you know, 10 years ago, uh, who would have thought you'd have in high schools have as many sports as we have now, you know, right, uh, right. F female wrestling, is 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 coming to high school sports obviously lacrosse and and uh some of those kind of sports so i mean who knows once it once it catches on as an olympic sport uh, 
you know, that could change, that could really change the landscape of, of uh, three on three a lot in the high school, in the high school arena. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think it's potential. Once you play it, once you see it, I, there's just so many more opportunities for kids to touch the ball and be involved. And so that's where obviously from a practice standpoint, if you think about being a coach and utilizing that within your practice setting to be able to just maximize the amount of reps that kids get. But I also think that it it's just fun. And so I can see where eventually you could get to the point where it might take off. You think about at least here in the Cleveland area, there's there's a handful of schools that are playing volleyball on the boys' side. There aren't many, but there are some. And I think back to when I was in school 25, 30 years ago and male volleyball at the high school level didn't exist. So at some point, I won't be surprised if that if that ends up happening. Head Start Basketball, along with members of the Jay Billis Skills Camp staff, will be hosting the very first Prime Skills Camp, an affiliate of the Jay Billis Skills Camp that is held annually in Charlotte, North Carolina. Prime Skills Camp will take place on the campus of Western Reserve Academy, just outside of Cleveland, Ohio, June 26th through the 28th, and will be designed for boys rising to grades 6 through 9. Prime Skills Camp will mirror the Jay Billis Skills Camp in daily programming, teaching, coach to camper ratio, and quality of instruction. Prime Skills Camp brings all of the team-oriented individual instruction, focus on the fundamentals, and high-level coaching to young men aspiring to a high school varsity basketball experience. This camp is operated by Billis Camp veterans and includes the Jay Billis Coaches Development Program alongside the camp, ensuring that the quality of teaching and coaching at this camp is second to none. Please visit headstartbasketball.com or jbilliscamp.com for more information or to get registered. So let's shift gears, not completely, but talk from this perspective about you've had an opportunity through coaching the junior national team, through all the mini camps, through all the training camps you've been to. You've had an opportunity to be around some of the best players in the country at an age when they're still in the process of developing. So one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about tonight was some of the intangible things that the guys who have gone on to have tremendous success in the NBA, what has kind of set them apart from, I don't want to say the average player, because obviously the players that you're seeing at the junior national team mini camps, those are some of the best players in the country. But clearly we know there's a difference between a good player, a great player, and then the best, the guys who end up going on and having success in the league. So just talk about some of the intangible things that you see from the guys who go on to have the most success later in their careers. What are some of the things that you've observed over the years? Well, you know, that's, I get that question asked a lot, uh, Mike, as far as what, what really separates, uh, you know, a good from a great player. And uh, I think, we, you know, even in our own high school teams, you know, we see, you know, we, we all have a best player. And so, you know, as you, as you think back on, on, your, on your teams, all right, what makes that player the best player? Uh, now, obviously, you know, they have to have some skills. Uh, the skills have to be really high level. Uh, they got to, they got to uh, you know, be able to, to do multiple skills really well. Shoot, defense, ball handling, you know. So, so that's obviously one thing that you look at. But you know, we're talking intangibles because a lot of players have skills that are really good, and and we see when we bring in, you know, when we bring in twenty five, uh, thirty five kids for U sixteen or U seventeen this year, they are they're all really good uh, skill wise. And, and physically, you know, uh, you know, they can jump, uh, you know, they're just physically gifted. And so uh, there's not much, really much difference in, in those 35 that we bring in from the physically gifted standpoint. And, and same goes for your high school team. Now, obviously, you may have one player who's much more physically gifted, uh, but he may not be the best player on your high school team. He may be the best gifted player, but you may, you know, you may have a, 
more valuable player uh, than than your best gifted player on your team. So uh, that's kind of what we're talking about. But uh, I talk, I probably visit with every NBA scout uh, at some point or other uh, during the year about kids that we've had come through uh, our programs. And and now it's really interesting for me because now I, I spend most of November, December, and January uh, watching these kids in their own high school environment. Um, and, and I'm on the, you know, now I'm on the administrative side uh, organizing these mini camps, inviting kids, watching and, and then inviting kids in uh, who I think would fit what we want. So, so that's been a little bit of a change for me because previously I, I coached those kids, but I didn't have really, I didn't go out and watch uh, a lot of the kids play with their own high school teams. So, you know, as I do that, I always, I always tell players uh, that, you know, when I, when I go out and watch you, uh, I always, I like to get, get to the game early because I, I like to watch how the kids that we're looking at, how they warm up, what their interaction is with their, with their teammates. Um, I, we think that's really important uh, from, from building, uh, you know, from sustaining our culture with USA basketball with high level players. You know, you can be a high level player and if you don't, if you don't have good interaction with your teammates and you're not a good teammate uh, or you're kind of a dog in warm-ups and, and those kind of things, you know, that, that sends a message uh, that, you know, you're, you're good, but uh, you're probably not the level that we want for our USA basketball. And so it, it comes as a shock to a lot of the, a lot of the players when we, when we tell them that. Um, the other thing is, you know, how, that we think are, is really important is is their body language, and and we're pretty upfront when we say if you if you really give us poor body language uh, or we see bad body language uh, when we go out to watch you, we, we, there are enough players that are equally as good as you that have good body language, so we're probably not going to bring you in. That's probably going to be one uh, you know a strike that uh, you're not going to get three strikes on that because we don't want players with poor body language who slouch in their chairs, don't listen to coach, uh, look up at the stands while the, during a timeout. Uh, you know, somebody makes a great play on the floor uh, uh, and you're not, you know, you're not happy for them. Uh, that, that, that just, it goes a long way in telling us what kind of person, player that you really are. And I think that separates uh, good from great. Um, but let me get back to, you know, what NBA scouts ask me. Uh, one of the first questions, uh, other than, because they, they really know how good a player is physically and skill-wise, but uh, they always want to know uh, more about the player, uh, being a good teammate, and those kind of things. Uh, but the first question they always ask me is, are they competitors? Do they really compete? And, uh, you know, when I first, first started coaching with the junior national team, I thought, well, that's an interesting question because that's the first thing they want to know. Uh, uh, how, how are they really, do they really compete? And very interesting uh, feedback from a lot of the scouts in the NBA is that they really think that being able to compete just being a competitor is is something that uh, a lot of players don't have and so that's probably one thing that separates good from great uh, I'll go back to uh, Brad Beal uh, who played for us in 09 and 10 was just uh, uh, one of my all-time favorites to coach and um, uh, you know he was he was such a competitor um, I mean, he, he was one of those who was absolutely not going to lose. Um, uh, unfortunately he's, he's on a losing team, team right now with the Washington Wizards. Uh, but you know, he was such a competitor that, um, uh, that it just, you know, it made everybody compete at a higher level. 
Um, so that I think that's one of the things that that separates. And you know, sometimes we've had kids that aren't aren't to that level, aren't aren't to the level that really compete. Um, and uh, and so when you when you take a look at that uh, aspect of, of a player, I think that's the same way on a high school team. Coaches that are listening, you know, you have a you have a player that maybe not be skilled, but you know, if they can compete, I look back on. You know, teams I've had at City High and McPrairie, you know, those players were invaluable. I mean, they were they were more valuable than players who were more talented uh, if they could really compete. One of the things we do uh, that I'll, I'll throw out to coaches that are listening because you may want to do it and put this down for your for your team next year is we we really chart wins and losses. So let's say we play three on three. Or we play four on four in practice, uh, or we play. We have a defensive uh, transition game where we play called the UC, UCLA drill or Laker drill. We chart individually who wins and who loses. So a player might be on a three on three team, um, uh, and then we, we play four on four, and and we chart if the, his team wins or loses, but we chart them individually, and that that. If you do that, you you will be surprised, I think, over, you know, you do that over a period of time, who really competes and who really um, really takes the bull by the horns and hates to lose. I, 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 you know, I'm not going to name any names, but there's been some really, really high draft picks that I, that I absolutely said, you know, they, they've, they've, they have not won with us. They haven't won in, in our practice sessions. They haven't won. Uh, you know, we, we cut them because we just didn't think they were they could win. And sure enough, when they get to the NBA, they're struggling. Uh, so that I think that's probably one of the big things I think separates good from great. And I think the other thing that I always think separates good from great players um, is the love of the game. Uh, do they really love the game? You know, a lot of times you get into big guys, especially. Do big guys really love the game? Um, you know, if they love the game, they're going to spend time in the gym. They're going to develop their their shots, their footwork, their skills. Without, you know, if they come in, if you practice at three and and they come in at two fifty five and they're done at five and they're home at five ten, you know, you question how much they really love the game. Uh, they can be very very skilled. But uh, I think that also says a lot. So I always make the point of one of the things that youth coaches need to do, uh, if you're coaching a youth, uh, eight, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 year olds, one of your, one of your main jobs is to have them love the game. And so if they love the game and they're obviously going to get, get a lot better. So I, I've kind of rambled there, but I, I would say being a great teammate, um, Body language, how you communicate, ability to compete, and then uh, love of the game. I think are some things that separate, in my estimation, separate good from great. And uh, as I look over the the ten teams that I've coached with gold medals, you know I can name you uh, J- Jalen Suggs of the world, Tyus Jones, Trey Jones. Uh, you know I could go on and on, but those guys really had a level, high level for competition. They could, uh, Jason Tatum was off the charts with that, uh, uh, you know, as well. Harry Giles, who's just, who's been injured a lot, but I know he just made a really good comeback with with the Sacramento Kings back in their starting lineup was a high level competitor. So those guys all had great body language. They, they communicated well, they loved to compete and, you know, they had a great love for the game. All right, I want to ask you one thing about the competitiveness piece of it. When you have a player who is on the level of a Beal or a Tatum in terms of competitiveness, and then you put them out on the floor with guys who are maybe just a step below that, do you find, have you found, both at the the national level with USA Basketball and then thinking back on your high school career, have you found that when you have that super competitive kid on your team, 
that that raises the competitiveness level of the rest of your players? Are they able to probably not get everybody up to the level that they are, which is why they're special, but do they raise the level of competitiveness within the practice setting for your team? Oh, I mean, that's, there's no question, you know, uh, there's no question on that. I mean, everybody wanted to be on a Brad Beal's team or a Jason Tatum's team or Jalen Suggs's team because they knew they knew how hard a competitor they were and they knew they were they had a great chance of winning just because they had those guys on on the team. So uh, I, I think I think that's another. You know, you talk about great players uh, raise the level of of. Uh, of everybody else, and there's, there's no question that they do that. I, you know, I, I, I think we use, we throw the term great around way too much. I don't, I don't think there's any really players that are, that are, you know, great. Great is something that takes place over a period of time. You can have a great play, but that doesn't necessarily make you a great player. And so I think kids hear how great they are. Um, but but the same token that that word great is is in my estimation you know you is is thrown around way too much because there there are very few in in even in the NBA there's very few great players uh, there's there's probably 20 25 players I would say are great players and then the rest of them are role players so those those great players have to you know they're 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 there because they they raise the level of play of the of uh, of everybody else there. Yeah, we had that discussion with uh, your guy Mike Procopio, and Mike talked about how if you look at the NBA, there's really twenty to twenty five guys that matter that are indispensable that have plays called for them that are sort of the do everything guys for their team, and then everybody else has to fit in and figure out what is it that I bring to the table that makes me valuable to this team. And I think that that's a lesson when you think about from being a high school coach or if there are players out there listening. Here we're talking about whatever, however many guys are on the league, 350, 400 guys in the NBA, best players in the entire world. And we're talking that 95% of those guys are role players. And so when you think about the number of guys at the high school or college level that become dissatisfied with their role and think they should be the star or get more shots or whatever it may be. And you think about as a coach, your ability to communicate what role a player should have and why they should have that role. And I think that's something that for coaches out there is critically important is to get players to understand what their role is. And then on the player side of it, it's important to figure out what role your coach wants you to play and then play that to the best of your ability. And then the things that you mentioned, Don, the intangibles that these guys that are going to the NBA have, those are things that we can control. Like I can control if I'm going to be competitive every single day. Now I know there's an, there's an innate competitiveness in some people that isn't present in others, but we can all raise our level of competitiveness. We can all decide that we're going to have great body language. We can all decide that we're going to be great teammates. And I think that on an individual level, from a player standpoint, you can make the conscious decision to be able to try to improve those things. And then from a coaching standpoint, those are things that you want to put time in with your team. You want to emphasize those things because if you can improve in those intangible areas, as you said a couple of times, that can sometimes overcome a more skilled player, a more skilled team on the other side if you have those intangibles working for you. And obviously that's with, you got to have a baseline level of skill clearly. But those intangibles, I think if coaches can focus on improving those with their teams and players individually can really think about, hey, how can I improve these things that are within my control? We'd all probably be a lot better off and the game of basketball would continue to grow and improve by leaps and bounds if we could accomplish that and get that message across. I, you know, I always kind of define a great player uh, by the level, and, and you alluded to this earlier, but uh, I always kind of define a great player by how much better he makes his teammates. You know, you can be a great player and, and not make your teammates any better. Um, yeah, I think that's I think that's totally true. I'm gonna I'm gonna share a story right now today, Don, that happened with me today. So I was outside today. As I'm social distancing, I'm outside with my son, who's in eighth grade, 
and we were talking about different things and we were talking about a player that my son played with and just talking about the difference in skill level. And I said, the player that you played with in this, in this situation, probably if I just look at the raw skills of that player, if I put you on the floor against a bunch of cones and I put him on the floor against a bunch of cones, he's probably better than you. But what's given you the advantage is you talk on defense. You're a positive person on the team. You know where you're supposed to be. You share the ball. You're not playing the game in isolation. You're playing, understanding that you're part of this five-man unit. And I said, if you play for a coach like he was fortunate enough to play for who recognizes those things, those intangibles are what push you over the edge. And now if you continue to improve your skill level and you combine skill with those intangibles, now you've really got something. But I think, as you said, it's really, really important that you look at the entire package as a player and as a coach, you want to make sure that if you want those things to happen for your team and with your players, you've got to make sure you put an emphasis, emphasis on those every single day. Yeah. You know, that's a great point. And we've all had players, you know, if you're, if you're those of you that are listening, we've all had players who, who, who you just say, you know what, he's got to be on the floor. He's got to play because we're better when he plays. All right, now, you know, you go back to why is he better? Well, he brings out the best of everybody. He's a competitor. He loves the game. All, all those kind of things fit there, and they're, they're, they're things that are very controllable. I mean, some of, the, some of the things that players, you know, can help their game out all the time are things that anybody, you don't have, it doesn't take an uh, outstanding skill level to raise your level of game uh, up at all. You know, it, it, like you said, communication, being a great teammate, all those things you can control. So uh, we try and really get that across to our, you know, our players. And, and you, you talk about the will to win, uh, you know, desire to succeed, and, and those kind of things, uh, you know, uh, are really, really important. But, but again, those are things that players can't control. Yeah, hopefully – as we get that message out and players hear it and we all know that it's a challenge and it's a challenge for players to sometimes be able to accept that role. And it's a challenge for players to, or for coaches to get players to accept that role. But I think the key is, is that you have to make sure that you're taking care of those intangibles, both as a player and as a coach. And if you do that and you raise the level in each of those areas that you talked about, I think you're going to have a more successful career as a player and more successful teams when you're a coach. Coaches, we've teamed up with Coach Tyler Whitcomb so you can now purchase his exclusive new playbooks right from the Hoopheads Pod website. If you're looking for ways to improve your team next season, these playbooks blend affordability with the quality content that serious coaches are looking for. Just visit hoopheadspod.com slash store and you'll find playbooks from John Calipari of Kentucky, Leonard Hamilton from Florida State, and Mike Young of Virginia Tech. Check out these great resources at hoopheadspod.com slash store. All right, let's move on from that topic to our last one that we wanted to talk about, and that's the five most important lessons that you learned over the course of your 42 year high school coaching career. What are the things if you were to give five pieces of advice or five things that you learned over the course of that career, just maybe share some of those things with our coaches that are out there in the audience. Well, you know, I, I think we all, we all kind of, as we all kind of evolve as a coach from the time you, or a young coach, whether it be an assistant or head head coach, and then, you know, after you coach 10, 20, 30, in my case, more than that, 42 years high school ball, um, and then involved with the USA team, I think we kind of all evolve as a coach. And so, you know, we all, it's that old saying, you know, we didn't know what we didn't know uh, as a young coach. And, uh, uh, after you coach for a while, now we look back and you now there are a lot of things I didn't know. Uh, but the time, <laughs> I always, I always say I know a lot less now at age fifty <laughs> than I knew when I was twenty-five. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, but that's a great question. I get asked that a lot as well. Uh, 
important, you know, what's, what, what are some really important things that maybe I learned as a high school coach? I think number one is, is, uh, you got to communicate. You, you, you almost have to over communicate. Uh, when you think that you're over communicating, then it might be just right. And then you communicate again. I'm talking with administration, with, uh, players, with, uh, you know, parents, uh, you, you can't isolate any of those people uh, and have them support your program. So I think I think communication, over communication, is really one of those keys. I mean, communicate with your players. If you decide, you know, you're going to change the lineup uh, and, and and have a starter come off the bench, in my opinion, you better communicate that before you do it on a, in a game night. Communicate with him why you're doing it. Here's where we're doing it. Um, you know, we did that with Colin Sexton and Jason Tatum. Uh, we both, uh, they both came off the bench for us uh, and ended up being MVPs for us in the world world championship. But, you know, we just didn't do it uh, without them knowing. We, we sat them down. In some cases, I'll call the parents. I would call a parent and say, hey, Johnny's been really good for us as a starter, but we think our team is going to be better with him coming off the bench. He's going to get the same minutes of playing time or whatever may help him come out of a slump, whatever. But I think over-communication, you almost can't over-communicate um, is number one. I think the second thing is practice fundamentals the entire year. One of the things I always thought that my teams did really well as I look back on, on my teams is that we seemed to get better uh, as the season went on and, and reached our peak at tournament time. I thought we always played our best basketball come district, state tournament time. And uh, I, and I look back, part of that is I think we stress fundamentals in every practice. You know, we just didn't come out and do some, uh, just do some free shooting and then work on some sets, out of bounds, whatever. We, we had good practices through the whole year, emphasizing fundamentals and getting better that way. So I think that was, I think that's, I think that's one of the things that I would go back to and, and learn. Um, number three, uh, as a high school and, and cut me off here, Mike, and Jason, I'm going to, to, no, you're uh, good. No, you're going, we're uh, rolling. And then number three, I think every coach must have, what, what are your non-negotiables? You know, uh, I learned as a high school coach, you better have some non-negotiables. I think you better, I think just three, not what are three non-negotiables, non-negotiables that you have for your team? And, and. What I mean by that are what are some things that you absolutely will emphasize on a daily basis, and if they don't do that, you are going to uh, let them know every time. So one non-negotiable, uh, and that can change from team to team, but one non-negotiable is we always had three players that we sent to the glass. Called, they're called crashers. You are you three are the crashers. And you're going to get to the glass every time that shot goes up. So a shot goes up and two of them are standing outside the paint, you know, we would call them out on that. That was a non-negotiable. Um, another non-negotiable is our wings. You sprint to the corner. We don't want you holding up at the 28-foot line or at the wing area. Um, uh, now, if it's an early up pass, you know, you'll, you'll get the ball, but you sprint to the and don't stop till you get to the corner. And that's, that's something to be called out on every time that uh, that, that didn't happen. So those are exam- or non-negotiables might be another one, you know, coming off a screen, we want, uh, you know, we want you to make sure you're trying uh, off of, off of setting side ball screen rolls, uh, really work on getting to the kill area. So that was kind of a non-negotiable for us. So, I think you have to pick out what are three non-negotiables that you are going to hold your players accountable to. Um, and and that, that's a point of emphasis. And I think that's something that I learned as a high school coach. Uh, and again, those may change year to year. Did you have some non-negotiables off the floor, like in terms of standards in that way? I know you were talked about ones that were on the floor, but did you have any that you would – say you used a lot or the ones that were common for you when you were coaching off the floor? Yeah, I think, you know, one of those obviously is, is we used, we always talked about being um, uh, 
the gym is a classroom. So once you step across that end line, you are now in my classroom. And, uh, you know, you're not, you're not there to, to visit with your, with your teammate about, uh, you know, about prom or whatever it is, you're there, we're starting to work. So that was, that's a non-negotiable. We have, you know, my assistants are on the court. We're ready to get going. When you step on that court, if, if you're out there early, then we're going to get some, we're going to get some good shots. So that's a non-negotiable, um, you know, just little things like, uh, you know, it, and neither right or wrong, but you require to have, are your players required to have their, their jerseys tucked in during practice? You know, is that a non-negotiable or isn't it? If, if you don't care, that's fine. And it really probably doesn't make a lot of difference. But if that's one of the things that you would like to have your players do, but then you better, you set that standard. And so now you have to enforce that. That's a non-negotiable. So if somebody comes with a shirt tail out, all right, you better, uh, you as a coach, I need to address that. Or shoes and tight. You know, the, the biggest thing I hate is how can you come to practice and have your, you know, have your laces up tight. <laughs> Although I will say, Don, it's very interesting because when I played, I felt like me and every single person that I ever saw or played with wore high tops. Now, maybe there was one exception and everybody had their shoes tied super tight. And now you watch basketball and the number of guys that are A and girls that are wearing low top shoes and I have so many kids that I'll see that will play in actual real basketball games with their shoes, not necessarily untied, but but they're super loose. And I just don't know how you play with your shoes like that. To me, it's just has nothing to do with a standard. It's just I don't know how you, I don't know how you play like that. Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, some kids like their shoes a little looser, which is fine. But but don't come on the court with your with with not them with with not tied up and ready to play. Um, however you like them so you know those are non-negotiables i think as a young coach i i i probably didn't realize how important non-negotiables were to our team i I think you know you guys have both been to snow valley and i think you know as i talk to the kids uh in in our in our mass group session i i try to i try to give some non-negotiables to them you know hey here's how you sit here's how you listen uh you know uh and, and so you're so you're developing some culture with your non-negotiables as well, as well. So, um, well, uh, number three, I think number four, I would say. Number three, yeah. Uh, uh, I would say another one. Number four, I had uh, that I'm thinking about was conducting your practice efficiently. Is something I learned as a high school coach, and uh, you know, there's some there's a lot of things that you as a coach should control in your practice session. Number one is how much time you spend talking, which I think coaches talk way too much. Um, I think, I think players turn us off because we talk too much as coaches. Uh, you know, the, the old saying goes, they have uh, teenagers or young people have about seven second attention span, uh, which was done by a study. Uh, Stanford University, so seven seconds. So if you're talking to them for five minutes, you know, you've lost them for four minutes and 53 <laughs> seconds. So think about how much you talk. Secondly, think about how much you repeat things. Players tend to players will tend to uh, not listen to you the first time if they know that you're going to say it again. So I'm always really conscious, and I didn't always do this as a coach, but I, uh, I was always really conscious of, when I say, all right, getting five lines, I'm not going to say getting five lines four times. I say it once and then we do it. Um, and, and kids catch on to that. I mean, even our, even our elite kids, they understand and they, they like that. Um, I think coaches need to control the pace and the flow of, of practice because sometimes players will try to milk that pace to their, to their pace. And you need to, Coaches need to control the pace. And how you do that, I mean, you do it from maybe by having what I call a, uh, a transition shooting drill between going from working on your offensive to your defense. So you go from offense, you say, all right, um, let's do our keyhole shooting drill. Clock's running. You're going 
for how, how long does it take you to make 30 baskets? So right away you're into going from one to the other at a quick pace. Uh, don't let players walk to lines. So a lot of times, you'll if you come to practice, you'd hear me, even with our junior national teams, you'd hear me say um, five lines, no more than four in a line, line up in the baseline. And I would start counting backwards, seven, six, five. For some reason, when you start counting backwards, I, I don't even say anything. They know what, it, what that means. So uh, that sets the pace of practice because we all know if you let them do it at their own pace, they're going to drag their feet. They're going to uh, try and figure out what line they should be in. Now, that's that's a pace and flow that coaches should uh, the coaches should definitely control. How important is terminology in making that happen in terms of making sure that your players understand the names of the drills so that when you're pulling out a drill, you're not having to say, well, let's do the drill where we kind of do this. And then you, you remember that one that we, how important is the terminology to make the pace of practice go at the pace that the coach wants? I mean, you, you, you probably said the thing that I, for, I failed to because that, because that, that dictates the flow of your practice. All right. Keyhole shooting drill. And they know what it is. UCLA drill. They know what it is. So name your drills. And, and when you say it, they all know what it is. And so that, that is something that really controls the pace of your practice as well. So that's a great point. But, again, as a high school coach, you know, coaching 42 years, a lot of these things I think I learned just along the way by going to clinics and going to camps and learning from other people, uh, you know, how to do these things. Uh, so I think that's really important. So a couple other ones real quick. Am I good on time? You're good on time. You got as much time as you need. That was number four. So number number five, I think, then is kind of goes along with with non-negotiables, but um, you know, develop standards for your program. Uh, I, I think probably the last 15 years I coached, I don't think I ever mentioned the word rules. Rarely, if any, we didn't have rules. Uh, you know, rules have a negative connotation in my in my mind. When I was a player, you know, rules had a negative connotation. Here are the rules, blah, 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 blah. But you say, here are the standards. That That's more of a, definitely more of a positive way to say, you know, here's, here's what we're going to do, and we're going to do it in a very positive way. You know, so uh, being on time, you know, that's a, that's a standard of respect. How do you respect your teammates and your coaches and everybody else? You're you're on time. That shows respect. So uh, I think I think developing standards. And I'm I'm big on standards. I give I give uh, talks even to the corporate world on on setting standards in the in the workplace. And I think that's uh, those are things that that come to mind. Uh, we have 15 standards, and and Coach K was really good at setting standards. Uh, he would talk standards a lot with his senior men's team uh you know what standards do you think are important not rules they're standards and standards individual standards are something you hold yourself accountable to uh, so i'm going to hold myself accountable to to playing great defense or playing or, or being on time or you know uh, uh being positive with my with my teammate when something doesn't go right those are individual standards team standards are when you you hold your teammates to that standard, then you you really have a special team. Best teams, best teams I've had, uh, not including our national teams, but best high school teams I've had were always teams who who had kids on that team held everybody else to a high standard. You know what? No, you're not going to that party because there's going to be alcohol at it. That's you know that's holding other people to that standard. And so um, you know we talk about. I, I just think you can't uh, probably talk about those things enough. We talk about our 15 standards, and like I said, I, I'm very fortunate to give uh, to give many uh, sessions to to some corporate people that uh, you know they're 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 amazed at uh, some of the things that we do as coaches, but that can carry over to their to their workplace as well. Rules tend to feel like they are very top-down oriented from an authority figure on down. And I think standards 
are much more at the level where players are able to hold each other accountable and hold each other to those standards. And as you said, the most successful teams, I think you could talk to any coach on any level from youth all the way up through professional. And when you have teams that everybody's bought in and players are saying, hey, we don't do that here. Hey, you need to do this. Those are the teams that really excel beyond what you might think they're capable of doing because again they're just they're just together and they all have that same belief. <clears throat> kind of go along with that. I think some of the best teams I've coached were not my state tournament teams. I mean my most some of my most fun years were teams that, you know, finished thirteen and nine but but were just great kids and they had great standards and, you know, nobody nobody expected them to get 500 and you know and all that kind of stuff i think that that's really what you know kind of thrills me about coaching is when you have teams that uh really excel because of the individuals on that team had high standards Uh, yeah and i think that's something that somebody who is not a coach who has never coached would have a really hard time understanding how you might enjoy coaching a 13 and 9 team that did all those things that you just described versus another team that might have gone 20 and two, but should have been undefeated and just was not fun to be around on a daily basis because every day was a struggle to get them to live up to the things that you want them to do. And I think somebody who hasn't coached would have no understanding of why, why you would feel that way. Yeah. I, and I'm, I've, I've said that for years and, you know, coaches talk about, you know, yeah. Sometimes, and I think I, I've, I talked to a lot of coaches who, who had some miserable seasons that were twenty-two and three or, or twenty-four. You know, those right, teams. exactly. And and, and uh, yeah, and, and for a lot of different reasons, obviously. But I think uh, I think when you, you develop standards and they, you know, some of the some of the some of the teams, a couple of teams I've had that I can think back on. Uh, we struggled with standards and uh, uh, you know, when you struggle with standards, you're going to struggle uh, on the court too. I think at times, even though you're, you might win, you might win 20 games, uh, but it may, it may, it may be such that, you know, your, 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 your standards are, are set, but uh, they have a hard time uh, playing up to your standards. And I think, I think as you the longer you coach, you kind of you really understand that and, and try and make that uh, you know try and make that a high point of your of each team. Yeah, and I would think sometimes that the growth rate of your team as well in terms of how well they're able to live up to the standards. Where beginning of the season it's a struggle, and mid season they're starting to get it, and by the end of the season they really get it. And then I'm sure there you had other teams where right out of the gate. They got it, and then I'm sure you had other teams that <laughs> never got it. Yeah, and and the the fortunate thing with our with our national teams, um, and we spent a lot of time on on developing standards. Uh, obviously, with with like all 35 of them when they come in, and 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 players that don't buy into it, I, I think, uh, you know, you you we cut them before they get to right, they right. get to be go, go another direction right. really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So, so those are five. One more, one more, one more quick thing. All right, bonus one. We're ready. Uh, I would play more three on three in high school. I think uh, when I learned as a high school coach, I think three on three is puts the puts each player in a position where they they really have to play the game. They have to understand how the game is played offensively. And uh, and they really have to understand defensively how to cover. So I would probably I was thinking about playing. I mean, I would probably play more three. Not that we didn't do it, especially toward the end of my career. But I think I would certainly recommend. That's one thing I learned is that uh, every day ten ten minutes of three on three would be uh, very beneficial. Yeah, I agree. I think that's something that. Me personally, again, we talked about how you evolve and grow as a coach. And I think if you look back on, I would look back on my career, the practices that I ran or the practices that I was in charge of, a lot of those practices early in my career would have been 
very drill oriented uh, and, and and not as much of the small sided games. Now, again, did we scrimmage and go five on five? Sure, we're working on offense and defense and that kind of thing. But I think now that there's a balance between your skill development piece of your practice, you have then the competitive piece of your practice where you're just developing basketball players. And I think that's what three on three really does a great job of or what Snow Valley Cutthroat really does a great job of is just developing basketball players and basketball IQ. And then the final piece of it is the five on five and going through and doing the things that your team needs to do. But to me, if I was to give a coach a template for building an effective practice, I think those are the three things that would be a part of it. You'd have some skill development, you'd have some IQ development, which would be the smaller sided games, three on three, four on four. And then you'd have your five on five total team development. I think that's if you just start with that as the basis for the structure of your practices and you have one element of each of those in every practice, and then obviously you can figure out what skills that are that your team needs and what things you need to work on. You can put them in different situations. But I think if you use that as the basis, you're going to be in a pretty good spot in terms of preparing a, a quality practice for your team. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, that kind of goes along with, I think, uh, looking back on, on, on teams getting better as the year goes on. I think that – fits right in with that. I talked about, you know, we worked on fundamentals year from day one through day 65 practice, whatever. And the three on three is an important part of that. So I think that, that goes along with your team just getting better as the year goes on. Absolutely. Don, we cannot thank you enough for spending an hour and 15 minutes with us tonight. I think the things that you shared, one, first of all, the update on what's going on with USA basketball and then two, talking about intangibles that players need to go from good to great. And then finally, the five things plus the bonus that you learned over the course of your career coaching in the high school level. I just think that it's been invaluable. I know the coaches that are out there listening always look up to you and the things that you've been able to accomplish in the game. So to be able to have you share with us for this time has been, again, invaluable. And we just like to say thanks. And to everyone out there, we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Hey, everyone. Last year at the Junior NBA Summit, I came across an amazing company called iSport360 and its founder, Ian Goldberg. Their youth sports app gets coaches, players, and parents on the same page. Your team can set goals, share player feedback, training videos, sticker rewards, player evals, and practice assignments. All of this to foster a healthy team communication and culture. If your team or club struggles to keep open lines of communication, especially among team parents, iSport360 can help. If you want to empower your athletes to have more success, more confidence, and more communication with their teammates, give iSport360 a try today. Shoot me an email, mike at hoopheadspod.com, or give me a call at 216-392-4059 to learn more. Being without basketball right now is tough for all of us, so we've partnered with Pro Skills Basketball to offer you a 50% discount on their ultimate shooting guide and video program that will put players on a guided path to becoming the best shooter they can be. With one year's worth of workouts that includes games, drills, and competitions, players will gain access to a blueprint showing them what it takes to become an elite level shooter. If you're looking to improve your shooting at home, this program can help. Visit hoopheadspod.com slash store to check it out. Registration is now open at headstartbasketball.com for this summer's Head Start Basketball Camps. We'll be hosting camps for boys and girls in grades 1 through 6 throughout the greater Cleveland area. Get registered today and make sure you hit the courts with us this summer. Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast, presented by Head Start Basketball.